Ian McEwen was born in Hampshire, England in 1948. His father was a working class Scotsman who rose through the army to the rank of major. So young Ian spent much of his childhood where his father was posted in East Asia, Germany, North Africa, including Libya. I mean, it, it's interesting that nowadays his books are translated into all those languages and 30 more. Um, his family returned to England when he was 12, just a year younger than the protagonist in Atonement. Did any of you see that movie, read that book? It was fat. That's why you're here, right? So he was the first in his family to be highly educated, but he really took to it. In his great depth, his books are meticulously researched. His science, his love of science is obvious. The books are too many to, to list here. Some are listed in your program. Um, but some of my favorites are Amsterdam, Enduring Love, Chesil Beach, Saturday, Sweet Tooth, Solar, Cement Garden, The Comfort of Strangers, Black Dog, and the most recent, I just love the Children's Act. Did you, did you read that? It's terrific. So among his honors of the Booker Prize Award, the Royal Society of Literature and Royal Society of Arts in England, as well as the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, now Rushdie and and Amos live in New York, but Ian McEwen is still in England, and yet he is a, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's well liked by his and admired by his peers and readers despite his galling high sales, <laughs> as well as good reviews, wrote The Independent. And I was struck by a comment I read that he made that said about his love of hiking. He said, hikes are a means of being drawn entirely into the present. And that's what his books do. You're right there. So you must have been in the ocean or someplace to have missed all the publicity about Nutshell, a Shakespearean drama, and as it says in your program, of murder and, dece and deceit in which the only witness is an inquisitive fetus. But what it doesn't say in the program is that that fetus is very fond of the wine the mom drinks. <laughs> The book came out this week here. Um, it was earlier in England, and the Times of London said, this is far, there's far more going on in this fiercely intelligent novel than first meets the eye. At once playful and deadly serious, delightful and frustrating, it is one of McEwen's hardest to categorize and all the more interesting for it. So in conversation with the wonderful Wesley Stace, uh, we will now introduce Without decanting him through a placenta, I bring you our intoxicating author, Ian McEwen. Thank you. Welcome, Ian McEwen, to Philadelphia. Thank you, Philadelphia. Let's, uh... Look at this full house. Now, um, let's start off with a, about your new novel, Nutshell, uh, I saw you give a talk um, or a, a reading uh, in Brooklyn for Atonement a few years ago. And you, I remember you saying that uh, you started it with an image, I think, of a girl. It just came into your head, a, a girl perhaps in a back, the back garden of a house or something like this. And I remember it being, it was an image that you thought about hard and wanted to explore. And I wondered if there was a similar moment with Nutshell for you. It was parallel, uh, but even more, uh, more of a gift in a way. I was at the most extraordinarily dull and very long meeting, uh, a kind of literary festival in a foreign language, which I'm not going to identify because I don't want to upset my hosts who are very kind. But it involved sitting for seven hours in a room <laughs> with 800 people a while actors came on stage uh, and read my work. Um, and I knew where we were because uh, of the names, but apart from that, I had no idea what was going on. But I was under scrutiny, so I froze my face into a look of total attention and pleasure and thought, I'll do some daydreaming. And no sooner had I started that when, as if on a sort of ticker tape, uh, a sentence came given by God, and it said, so here I am upside down in a woman. And I thought, uh -huh. what, uh huh, what could I do with that? And, 
and I made a note of it afterwards. And I've always felt that hesitation is a crucial element in creativity, um, not uh, celebrated enough. Uh, forget writer's block. Writer's block is simply hesitation. Um, and it's a great deliverance. You can say to people, you don't have writer's block. You're simply pausing. Uh, and at the same time, I was rereading Hamlet. Uh, and somehow the sentence and Hamlet got entwined, and my daughter-in-law was heavily pregnant. I sat with her one afternoon and kept thinking, uh, looking at this little mound, uh, thinking, so there's someone in there upside down in a woman, and she could be, he could be listening, she could be listening. It turned out to be a she, in fact. Uh, and then once that concept was in place of a fetus with full cognition, uh, wandering about the world that he was about to join, enacting somewhat the plot of Hamlet, <laughs> it really was, it was intact and launched on its way. And although there were bits that were difficult to write, uh, fundamentally, the whole thing was there in the first sentence. The wish for the reader to... Um, suspend his or her disbelief was right there. Kind of <coughs> it's magical realism. Would you I, call yeah. it that? I just thought, I, I spent 20 years, you know, hanging out with neurosurgeons and spies and experts on this and that, and what a holiday it was from realism <laughs> to stay at my desk, research absolutely nothing, uh, and throw out the window all the laws of biology and physics. I'm not sure what the magical bit right. is, really. Uh, just, it's improbable and not even real. Well, it's got, the book's got a very <clears throat> distinct style, which is mm. the voice of the baby. Mm. How did that n naturally develop as the comical voice that it is, or was that something that came kind of intact just with that first sentence, or did you discover it as you were going along? Well, for a long time I thought, uh, and still cling vaguely to the idea, that... This wasn't Hamlet, this was Shakespeare talking, about to be reborn. Uh, there's the magical bit, I suppose. Um, and so I immersed myself in a lot of Shakespeare's prose. Um, and um, you know, I could count myself king of infinite space. And, um, I could be bound in a nutshell, count myself king of infinite space, were it not that I have bad dreams, is a wonderful piece of prose as is, you know, what a piece of work is a man, and so on. And so I did think that I would try and get a good iambic pulse in the writing, before mm -hmm. thinking of anything else. Uh, but at the same time, have him think a lot about the trochee. Uh, I think those of us who love Shakespeare and love reading him, as well as going to the theatre, uh, know that the reverse of the I am, the, the strong weak, the falling, uh, foot in Shakespeare is just as important as the I am. So there's a lot of, uh, you asked me where the voice came from, partly it was from an, an immersion in, in, in Shakespeare's prose. Uh, I just let him look after himself. You, you must know how this is. You, you get someone talking on the page uh, and you set them free. That's how it happens. And it is, I mean, it is, a comic novel. I hate that word. But it, <laughs> but it is, okay, but it's funny. Yeah. And it's also a mystery novel, in a kind of a yeah. way. Well, comic novels, my image of a comic novel is being eight years old and bigger boys knocking me to the ground, holding me down and tickling me. You know, that, um, <laughs> the comic novel wants to make you laugh at every turn. Right. Whereas I think of this as a novel that might have some humorous stretches, but and I, uh, and certainly want it to be that, but I did want him to speculate about the world he is going to join, and he knows he's entering a world into a condition uh, in the world of, of modernity, and he lists the delights of modernity, anesthetics, oranges in winter, electric lamps to read by, all those privileges that um, Shakespeare didn't have. Um, and to wonder about the 21st century, the world that he's about to join. Uh, it's, it's nightmares, 
uh, its dreams. These are the dreams that trouble him. These are the bad dreams that he overhears on the radio when his mother... He can kick his mother awake. All sorts of freedom are allowed to you when you start narrating from the point of view of a fetus. <laughs> Disregard the fact that you can't see a thing. You hear everything. Uh, you also can get into bed with your mother, with, with her lover, uh, in a way that no other narrator could. Uh, uh, except, of course, an omniscient one. It's quite harrowing, some of those moments, aren't they? Yes. Uh, this is not a public information novel, so uh, <laughs> you should not have vigorous sex in your 38th or 39th week of pregnancy, nor should you drink copious amounts of wine. But on the serious side of this, uh, it allowed me to have a figure who's about to join the world and play his part in it, and to fret about its condition, uh, as well as also feel colossal curiosity uh, about uh, what he's about to move into. So I, I like to think of the moods, uh, it w I would feel stricken if this was thought of as a comic novel. And but that, that might be because there's a kind of a, a way that the, the comic novel has a rather, as you say, tedious aspect yeah. of wanting you to laugh, whereas yeah. your, your fetus is quite um, a philosophical yeah. fetus, and, yeah. and this, is, this is achieved, as you mentioned, by having him listen to a lot of podcasts. Podcasts. <laughs> through his yeah. mother. Literally. Through his mother, literally, yes. Who is a, yeah. you know, stays awake at night and listens to podcasts. That was very handy. Well, he, the one, like Hamlet himself, uh, a fetus doesn't have much agency. Um, and there are only a handful of things a fetus can do. One is to kick your mother awake so she turns on the world service or puts on a podcast. And the podcasts <laughs> and the radio are his major source of, of information about the world and also overheard conversations. Uh, he's listened to a podcast uh, 15 hours long called Know Your Wine. Um, <laughs> and when his, when his mum settles down to an evening of drinking with um, his uncle Claude, uh, there's no way a fetus can say no to a drink. Um, and as he points out, uh, most people will have forgotten uh, the experience of a really fine Sancerre uh, decanted through a healthy placenta. Um, <laughs> he, so, he's, he's got a lot of feet in the world already. If he's, um, yes. he, I mean, he's already engaged, and he knows his wine. Uh, he's, he's listened. <laughs> he, can, he can date and locate wines to the nearest field, um, <laughs> as long as they're French. Um, and also, while he's in there, like, uh, like any uh, detective, he is working out the clues to something that at first he doesn't realize is a mystery, and I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know uh, how, spoiler-wise, where one wants to go on no, that. No, spoilers, yeah, fine. Um, <laughs> Everybody knows the plot of Hamlet, uh, <laughs> so why not? But the... Um, but the, you know, he's solving a mystery, and the mystery is first, you know, he reveals to us that the person we have presumed to be his father yeah. is not his father, and that's revealed very early on. And mm. then there's a murder coming up, and it's up to him to kind of sort out what's happening to whom at what point. He, he discovers around about chapter three or four that her, his mother's lover is, in fact, his uncle, his father's brother. Uh, so. I've diverged a little from Hamlet because Hamlet opens, uh, his father's already dead, and the funeral baked meats have coldly furnished forth the wedding tables, and Hamlet is sulking around court till he mm. gets the chance to speak to his father's ghost. Uh, I thought it'd be a little more interesting from the point of view of a novel to be in on the plot of the murder yeah. and to overhear all its uh, twists and turns and elaborations. Uh, something that Shakespeare decided not to do with Hamlet. Uh, in Shakespeare plays, uh, people just step three feet to one side and they become invisible to the, 
the main characters who are speaking on stage. And it's a wonderful convention. Uh, and I think having a fetus is a sort of an equivalent. I mean, it's the arras, as it were. Um, but not Polonius behind it, but um, you know, uh, someone who is now, uh, once his father is successfully murdered, uh, he feels the weight of uh, that he must avenge this. And it's very difficult um, when you're a fetus <laughs> yeah. to avenge your father's death. Mm. Um, it's, it is a compact book yeah. as a uh, children's hour, children's act, was yes. a compact, and I enjoyed Children's Hour as well. Very good. Uh, uh, not by you. Um, uh, was a compact book, as you know, Solo was. So, and I think um, you've always been a writer of fairly, you know, compact. Uh, some of them aren't, but generally they are. Do you think that you, over the years, and I'm not asking you to look at your entire mm. development as a novelist, but you've kind of started, you've honed in more on a on an idea that you have stuck to and looked at from every angle for the duration that is necessary? Yeah, I try to make my novels no longer than they need be. Uh, we have word processes now, so we know instantly. I can tell you this is 42,000 words long, approximately. The Children Act was 48,000 words. Mm. But Sweet Tooth was, I don't know, 90. Mm. I mean, so it depends what's got to be unfolded. I, as a reader, love short novels. Uh, not, not because long novels bore me, but I, I do think that short novels can bring out the best in writers. Uh, it, f it, it puts demands on them that means that they are concentrating at the level of the sentence, mm. not just the whole thing spilled out, as it were, thought onto the page. And when you think of those great novelists of the uh, 20th century, how uh, how they worked when they devoted themselves to the novella. Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, uh, all kinds of novellas of Lawrence, uh, Kafka's Metamorphosis. I mean, the list is long. Uh, Henry James, Turn of the Screw. Uh, I know these books get set in, in, in universities largely on the assumption that you can't get students to read long novels. Uh, <laughs> but all the same... I think that the writers I've just mentioned rose to their best. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I, also, again, part of the pleasure of reading a short novel or a novella is that of holding the whole structure in your mind at once. Very difficult to do with a 700-page novel mm -hmm. on first reading. You, could, you can do it on second. But something that's taken you three or four hours to read and you can actually take pleasure in the shape, not just in you know, the, the story, the, you know, all, all the other little things and big things that make up uh, the pleasure of reading fiction, but to actually hold in your mind all at once the whole thing, much as you would if you went to an Ibsen play uh, or saw a movie that you loved um, or went to an opera, mm. an intact experience. And I... I don't know, I, and if I, I will depart this earth with a succession of shorter and shorter novels, um, <laughs> and the reason won't be the pursuit of pleasure, more like the decline of powers, but, uh, and I, I don't discount writing at length again, yeah. um, but there's a lot to be said for it. Well, I mean, <coughs> being not that this is important necessarily to this interview, but being the age I am and being British and being 50 years old, I, I have literally, you know, grown up reading your things from reading your first two books, which are short story collections themselves, and then your first novel, which was a very short novel, The Cement Garden was the first one, right? And then The Comfort of Strangers, which I just found my own copy I was given for my 16th birthday, dedicated to me by a friend in the cover. You know, and, I, and it's not like you started off writing longer books and have pared down. No. But also, uh, when I look at that incredible curve of your books, I've seen there have been moments when uh, kind of a magical realism has been more uh, to the fore, and there have been moments when scientific matters have been more to the fore because you've lived a whole life that you've, mm. you know, as I have lived my life 
doing things and reading your books as part of it. You've spent your life doing that and writing them. When you look at that whole curve of your career, what do you remember as being some of the, it's a, it's a very silly question really, but being some of the most enjoyable <coughs> moments of creation during that time? Purely, you know, that entertained mm -hmm. you and, and now you look back and that's the Polaroid mm -hmm. snapshot. One of the odd things about writing this novel is that I felt very connected to my 22-year-old soul. Um, it's a, bits of it are a bit like some of those very yeah. early short stories. I was very caught up with wild, crazy, improbable narrators. One of my narrators was uh, a chimpanzee yeah. who was having an affair with a novelist. Um, <laughs> And she uh, was struggling to write her second novel after a huge success of the first. Um, and that owed much to Kafka, uh, who has uh, um, lectured to an academy, um, uh, a gorilla uh, who's left the jungle and become a professor, um, <laughs> addresses a learned academy. And then there's investigations of a dog of, of Kafka's, a yeah. dog reflecting on human nature. Mm. Uh, and, of course, we could say of metamorphosis, it's narrated by uh, a giant insect. Um, what I took from Kafka, uh, and we don't, do we think of metamorphosis as magical realism? I mean, it seems too good for such a term. Yes. A man wakes up in the morning uh, after troubled dreams and finds that he's been transformed into a giant bug or insect, and there's a lot of this discussion, especially in Nabokov's Cornell lectures about what kind of bug he is. Uh, and his legs are waving feebly in the air. But this is the brilliant thing is his main concern is he's going to be late for work. Um, <laughs> and it's the banality and real realism of that. that so somehow to I suppose I'm still there in Kafka's shadow that if I have a fetus talking, that you only have to cross that line. But then the rest is, as it were, a, a real person just addressing the world. Uh, so you throw all the, the, the laws of biology out, but then you bring them all back yes, in a yes, sense. Yes. <coughs> I never liked magical realism uh, because it seemed to me like tennis without the net. Um, <laughs> In other words, you could have a situation in which things were getting tough and someone could sprout some wings and fly out the window. Uh, whereas in the plausible uh, 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 and tightly enacted real, mm. you've got to see this through to the end in, in the world that we share. But Kafka's way of sitting across both worlds, uh, I, it, it really struck me as I was writing Nutshell. I'm back to where I was uh, as a... 22 year old in 1970 writing crazy narrators. So th there is a pleasure in that. Just to get to your question, which it's not a silly one, it's a really good one. What, what are the moments of high pleasure? Those moments when you feel you've been set free. You, you've got an idea and its essential element is freedom. Uh, even if it's in the most confined circumstances mm -hmm. like a womb, uh, you feel then uh, it's not happiness, it's well-being. You know, a, a kind of sense that you've got a secret, you're not going to talk about it, uh, you're going to sit on it uh, and let it secretly grow. And there have been various moments in my writing life. Uh, starting Atonement, which you mentioned at the beginning, yes. was for me a, a, a real thrill of excitement. Although the, I had a, a lot of false starts. I mean, I thought when I started Atonement, I was writing a science fiction novel. Um, I thought it was set in the 23rd century. Um, and Robbie the gardener, I thought, had little um, diodes in his head. Uh, I mean, it was so absurd. Uh, and I scrapped it and started again. But suddenly I thought, who is this figure in the garden? Who is this, girl? Who is this young woman with all flowers she's just picked by a meadow? And once I'd arrived at her young sister putting on a play, mm. then I thought, now I'm free. Uh, and it's a joy that's tinged with a kind of terror because you feel you've, you've finally got something that you want, but you could screw it up. Uh, I know you 
exactly yeah, what you need. Yeah. And you, it, I'm sure it happens in music as well. Yeah. You get a great idea for a tune, but you could screw it up. I don't mean to interrupt what you're saying, but are those moments sometimes actually kind of analogous to writing itself? I mean, in other words, when you're writing some of these scenes, they almost become a little bit about you writing them a little bit in, those, in that moment of liberation. I think that's the condition uh, we have to inhabit living in, in the after the great modernists. I mean, yeah. you can no longer write as if you were Jane Austen or Thackeray, even if you had the talent of either. Uh, the great masters of modernism, and I, I put it at its peak, uh, Joyce, have left us in a situation where every sentence you write contains uh, instructions on how to write that sentence or a reflection on what that sentence actually means. So it's as if in painting, it's not only the bowl of fruit of Cezanne, uh, and you can tell I've been in the barns today. Nice. Um, <laughs> um, but it's also a discussion on, uh, on two and three dimensions and what it means to apply paint. It, it is self-aware. We, we have lost that kind of innocence. We can't go back, I think, uh, if we are going to properly inhabit the literary tradition. But that doesn't mean we can't have characters and plots and, 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 and plunder the 19th century for all the beautiful things that it uh, mm. uh, left to us. But it does mean that we also have this other element, this mm. other, I think it's an exquisite element. Uh, you can't abandon it. I bet you never thought you'd see quite so many Renoirs in one day as you did today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm all Renoired out, actually. I know. Um, I get a bit Renoired out um, after about the second one when I see them like that. <laughs> I couldn't get Cezanne out, though. No. Uh, no, I, I, uh, but it was a bit like, um, I mean, we just uh, digress here. Going into the barns, and it's a bit like, do you know there's a line in uh, Eliot in the wasteland where you know, I had not, got, crossing London Bridge, I had not thought death had undone so many, and then sees his friends coming across. You're here too. And I kept thinking, when I came into the room and there was Mont Saint Victoire, I thought, you're here. Um, <laughs> what are you doing here? Uh, lots of moments of that. Uh, also, it was... I never knew you were in the barns. So, <laughs> <laughs> some people get a bit muddled by the barns because unlike an, you know, the, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, it's not presenting everything no. as great, it's just presenting things that were there. Some, some of the things are patently not so great, but they're by somebody he knew or liked, or yeah. who, in one case, I think is art dealer. Mm. It's quite an interesting uh, yeah. gathering. It's quite overwhelming. I mean... I'd rather like more space around each painting, personally. <laughs> Don't I mean, go to the barns. I mean, <laughs> to go into a room with 83 masterworks of the uh, <laughs> yeah. impressionist and post-impressionist era is like to be sort of hit around the head with a cudgel. Um, <laughs> but it's a nice cudgel. I think, I think something I'd like to ask, and I'd, perhaps you're asked this all the time, perhaps not. In your novels, often, there is a scene that gets into a particular thing, and then really goes for it. Mm. I'm remembering the game of squash in Saturday. Oh, yes. And I'm thinking of her cutting down the stinging nettles, or whatever she's doing in, in atonement. Mm. What is she doing? That. Yeah, she's swiping and stinging right. nettles. But, and but she's also killing a family. Right, and in yeah. everything she does, you know, there's a, there's a and metaphor, and, you know, it gets, and I could think of many different examples of this in your work, and they're always a kind of a... Uh, quite, um, quite a high point in the books, I think. Mm. Are they things that you think of carefully in advance and go, well, here's a metaphor, I'm going to go for this, or is it something where you get lost in the writing of it and just decide that this will be a powerful moment that you're going to let free a little? It's, it's much more the second case. Uh, just to come back to Nabokov uh, and his beautiful lectures to students at Cornell in 1953, there's a lecture he gave um, on reading, which I always thought is, is, is good advice on writing as well. He said to students, look, you, you're in your first year, you know absolutely nothing. I mean, you would not get away with saying that now, I know, um, <laughs> on campus. Um, you haven't read enough, 
And you have just got to f forget the moonshine of generalization when you read books and then write about them for me. Uh, he said, forget all about themes. Your only job as a beginner reader is to fondle the details. Um, and fondling the details, I think, is, is what writers do. You get a detail, and it's like a, a kind of an accordion. It sort of opens out opportunities, mm -hmm. more of the freedom I was talking of earlier. And part of, I think, of the art of writing fiction is to surprise yourself, to find the little module that will bring us, bring one the freedom. And those scenes that you mention, and, uh, and I'm pleased you mentioned the scenes you did, because usually people say, oh, the balloon scene of Enduring Love or uh, cutting up the body and... Um, the innocent. The innocent, so on. Uh, you know, great scenes of enormous crisis. Right. But it's when you hit your stride at 9.30 on a Wednesday morning, uh, and you will end up with maybe 800 words or 500 words at lunchtime that you you did not know were coming. Mm. And the part of the pleasure uh, is, that, is that surprise, that one thing just opens out into another. So it always starts with the detail. So you send your character who's 12 years old down to slash some nettles. But slashing nettles is not just slashing nettles. Mm. And other things just balloon outwards from it. And that picks up again on, on what you were asking me about writing that is a commentary on itself. And right. Th th that really, uh, those set pieces, as it were, uh, do reflect. And, and one hopes that the reader notices the brush strokes, as it were, that this is, uh, this is writerly. You know, this, this is aware of what it's doing. That's a, it's a lovely answer. With regard to your books, I think when one thinks of the neatness of them uh, and the compactness of them, they seem like they might be very carefully, they might have been very, very carefully plotted before the work was even begun. Uh, having written some uh, novels myself, I realised that, that, that although that can be done, there is a moment when you feel the characters blossoming and blooming and perhaps not being about to do the thing, having them being, I mean, perhaps this is, you know, I'm, well, I'll ask, I'll say what I'm going to say and then you can disagree with it all. But, you know, but the, when, by the time you've got halfway through, you've developed a character that is so much fuller and richer than you could have possibly conceived when you first had this idea mm. that what you had planned for them is no longer possible. Is that just the kind of hippie load of rubbish, or <laughs> would you say that that is the state of every novelist who writes novels, that things are, as things become more real, so whatever you would envis originally envision becomes, has to be changed, or ma and, and I'm, I'm really mm. just asking, how well planned are they, and how, how much do you stick to the plan, or is it different every time anyway? I think you've got to have some rough idea uh, of where you're heading, otherwise it gets very difficult to proceed. So I, I mean, if you think of it as a journey, it would be like you've dr drawn a map on the back of an envelope. Right. Uh, and it is not a big ordnance survey map that you have. Although in the Morgan Library, uh, 80 closely typed pages of Henry James pitching a novel to a publisher early in his career. And the whole novel describes the novel he's going to, the whole 80 pages describes in about 50,000 words exactly. the novel he's going to write Paragraph by paragraph. Yeah. It's a sort of meta novel <laughs> telling you, uh, giving you a summary of each paragraph. Uh, this uh, both suggests uh, an amazing artistic control and complete insanity. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because nothing can live and breathe. Uh, and interestingly, uh, in the Morgan Library, right uh, in the same case, I'm, I'm sure the case is no longer contains the same things as two years ago, uh, there is the publisher's rejection letter. Um, Too well thought out, Mr. James. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How not to write a novel. So if you think of novels as journeys or as um, processes 
of investigation, mm. just like any investigation, uh, you will uncover things that will offer you uh, fresh indications of m other directions to take. You've got to have space for surprise, um, and yet you've also got to have some control of the whole, so it's a delicate, a very delicate balance. I knew, and so I don't care about giving plots away, I knew that when I started Nutshell, that I have to make my narrator get himself born on the last page. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's the least he could do. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and it's the only revenge he could take. Uh, I'm, we're going to ask one more, I'm going to ask one more question as you, ladies and gentlemen, prepare any questions that you may have this evening. And I will say one thing about those questions. Um, please make them as short as possible. No, that wasn't it. Uh, I will say one thing, which is when we do ask the questions, remember this is being broadcast and so the microphone has to come to you before you start the question, okay? And I'm just going to ask one more question before we hand it over. <clears throat> Can you tell us, uh, um, those of us who've followed your career, um, any, uh, um, I know that you uh, told me there are two movies of your work happening, uh, being shot in October, mm -hmm. and um, everybody here, I'm sure, um, has seen Atonement, and those of us who, who from the very beginning saw The Plowman's Lunch, and uh, there was a movie of Enduring Love. Um, two questions, really, but not meant to have massively uh, long answers. Which was your favorite of those movies? And also, why do you think Atonement, of all your novels, is perhaps the one you're best known for? Um, there was a movie made of the cement garden. I never um, saw that. You saw it? I never saw you never it. You never saw it? I never saw it. Um, its director was Andrew Birkin, um, related to Jane Birkin, uh, made on a shoestring in the um, early uh, 90s, mm. uh, with Charlotte Gainsbourg as a, a 17-year-old girl, mm. an amazing cast, uh, beautifully done. Uh, the screenplay was by the director himself, who spent years over it, years and years and years. And I think it's a, a small masterpiece. Mm. I mean, I had nothing to do with it. Uh, I saw drafts, and we had some correspondence. Uh, but I've been generally very lucky with the directors I've worked with. Uh, we're making now, I've done the screenplays of the Children Act and on Chesil Beach. The young girl who played the lead in Atonement uh, is now that young girl is now a, a young woman, and, and she will play the lead in uh, On Chesil Beach. In fact, she's having furious sets of violin lessons, even as we speak. Uh, very difficult. She's got to you know, be the leader of a string quartet, and I've set her some of the most difficult music uh, that she's got to fake up. And she's got to insinuate herself into a, a real string quartet with three real musicians. Mm. Um, and they've got to play, for those who, who love string quartet music, she's got to play the last 30 seconds of the third uh, Razumovsky string quartet, Opus 59, which I think is one of the most tumultuous pieces. So we, there are special coaches who can get actors to do fingering, and, and of course it's all done with smoke and mirrors, but still it's very, very demanding. Uh, that starts shooting on the 15th of October. So two, two movies pretty much simultaneous. Yes, uh, The Children Act, uh, directed by Richard Eyre, who made who The made Plowman's, Plowman's Lunch, Lunch many, many years ago. Um, that starts shooting on the 16th. Which and was I'll never a novel. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. That was never a novel, though, was it, The Plowman's Lunch? That was only no, a screenplay, no, that wasn't was it? Yeah. I have done other... I did one with Macaulay Culkin um, in uh, the early 90s. Um, called The Good Son. It's a bad seed movie. I uh, remember that movie, yeah, with Elijah Wood and Macaulay Culkin. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. How about that? Uh, so, and, so just yeah, it, was, it was Elijah Wood's big break. I have, I've, I've forgotten that was you. So tell us just about atonement. What's your, th what's your theory on atonement being America, oh. why, why America wore its heart to a nubbin nuzzling mm. up? Uh, 
When I finished that novel, I phoned my editor, uh, Jonathan Cape, and said, look, I'm, I'm very sorry about Dan this. Dan Franklin? Yes. No, Tom Mashley. No, Dan Franklin. Dan Franklin. And I said, look, I've got to apologize. I've written this quite long novel, uh, and you'll probably find it rather boring, and I think it will be of interest largely to other writers, because it's all about writing. Uh, so I thought I was softening him up. Uh, and a few days later, he phoned and said, uh, you're crazy. Uh, it's got the Second World War, a country house, um, and a love affair. He said, so you know, we're, it's going to be a role. Said, and that's why I realized in this conversation that I could never be a publisher. I mean, I, I would have turned it down. <laughs> um, um, so uh, I think uh, a love affair, Second World War, and country house. Ingredients. Country house sort of does it for the United States. <laughs> and, uh, uh, we know what suckers you are for that. Yeah. Yeah. My, um, first, my first novel. Second World War does it for, for, for Britain, actually. We, yeah. we, we just melt because it's the last time we were good at anything. Uh, and love affairs are just a universal uh, concern. So, so just, just ingredients, really. Yeah, and one of these days I think I'll write another novel with those three things in. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Just when times are hard, yeah. yeah. Uh, you've mentioned a number of writers that you have been influenced by or liked Kafka, Conrad, etc. Would you share with us contemporary authors and perhaps some more classical or older author authors that you admire and tell us why? I've just finished, a, I think, a spectacular novel um, by Zadie Smith uh, coming out in, October, in November um, called Swing Time. Uh, I recommend that. Um, uh, for a great deal of my writing life, I've uh, stood back in wonder and admiration for the work of John Updike, um, who I'm very privileged to get to know a little towards the end of his life. I went to stay with him and his wife, um, and my wife, uh, about five, four, five years ago. Uh, the other giant that uh, uh, means a great deal to me has been Saul Bellow. Um, you ask for writers of the classical status. Well, I think almost of Shakespearean uh, stature is Jane Austen. Um, I think the precision, the care, the beauty uh, of, of her novels is an endless resource for us all. Um, very late in life, I've taken up reading Trollope. Um, I've never read a novel by Trollope before until two months ago I read a, a relatively short one called The Warden uh, and was swept away by it. I thought, how did people keep this a secret for me uh, <laughs> for 40 years of serious reading? Uh, so, and I've just started The Way We Live Now again. I think you know, I'm, I'm going to do nothing else but read that. Um, and luckily there's so many of them. Oh. <laughs> so the way we live now is 750 pages and he wrote it in six months. That's with the drafts too. So that's, you know. That's what, uh, while going to the office while by 9.30 a.m. I think. Yeah, that's four pages a day for six months uh, and then the rewriting. Um, what else? Well, I read a lot of non-fiction but that's a whole other subject. Uh, well, you're quite famous for your research, uh, or have been in previous novels. Was there actually any, I mean, I assume there was some kind of research, but was there any sitting down and, or going anywhere for Nutshell? Not a thing. I, like, uh, I clicked on Google to find some expensive wines. Um, that must have been a hardship. Yeah. Uh, I, I spoke at a private uh, gathering in, in Manhattan last night uh, to raise money for American Pen, and uh, our host, when he greeted me at the door, 
said, we tried to have only the wines that are in nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and one bottle cost $20,000. Uh -huh. So even I was astonished. I well, um, No wonder, what's happening to Penn? <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to think that <laughs> Penn paid for three cases of this wine and, 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 and uh, now having to sell their headquarters. <laughs> and, and it wasn't such a great fundraiser. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned that sometimes you start and then it doesn't move forward. Um, do you work at one project at a time or you start and you finish and then you restart again? How does it work? I'm pretty obsessive. Uh, monomaniac with writing, so I only do one thing at a time. Sometimes you simply have to break off. Uh, a great writer dies, and you're called on to write about him. I did this with Bello and Updike. Uh, there are writing duties you cannot avoid. There's a terrorist attack in Paris, and I'm in Paris. Uh, it has to be written about Charlie Hebdo uh, and the write about. So you have to stop what you're doing, and you accept that as the set of duties that are laid on you as a writer. It, you, you, there's no escaping the fact that uh, the privileges and luxuries of, of writing come with responsibilities. But those apart, I just do one thing till it's done uh, and really think of nothing else. Hi, I was thinking of how you described the fetus as a powerless observer, and then I was thinking of the beginning of Saturday, um, looking through the window at the uh, crashing plane, and I just wondered if you had something to say about modern anxiety or... <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we do describe ourselves living in a state of anxiety, uh, but I think it was more or less always thus. Um, I know that some people think the 1950s were a golden age, but it was actually racked by anxieties, um, largely about uh, a nuclear arms race. Uh, and I think pessimism about the world uh, is often earned and correct, but at the same time we mustn't blind ourselves to, um, or paralyze ourselves. With, um, by making ourselves uh, incapable of acting. Um, one of the reasons I like spending time in the company of scientists as opposed to liberal arts, know-nothings, um, <laughs> uh, is that when scientists, when, 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 when we in the humanities see a problem, what we want to do is moan. Um, <laughs> when you hang out with scientists, they see a problem, they want to solve it. Uh, and uh, I'm I still very involved in, in uh, seeing and, and conferences and so on in relation to climate change. And what's been borne on me, so just to take this as an anxiety that we all share, is that we probably stand on the edge of the most extraordinary revolution in energy. Uh, one of the great things that uh, your current president has achieved is that across the United States, there are 75 separate well-funded projects to discover a cheap and easy way of storing electricity en masse. That is the great holy grail of, of, of those who actually see climate change as a problem that you could solve. The moment you, the, the instance you have a way of storing vast amounts of electricity you have solved the problem of intermittency with solar panels and with, with wind turbines. You can harvest vast amounts of energy in summer to use in winter, as it were, and you can do it in a micro level off rooftops, store up your energy in summer for, for winter use. Because the one thing that needs to be solved for this is to stop putting the sewage of carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, we have all that technology except for the battery, you know, the, the giant, the mass battery. We're almost on the edge. Harvard Group's there with an organic flow battery. Uh, there's a project already up running based on it in Italy. Uh, in the next five years, as soon as that. So I speak 
you know, uh, our pessimism is useful. You know, we mustn't be smug, but at the same time, we mustn't paralyze ourselves into thinking that we can't actually solve this. Uh, so, sorry for that long instance, but uh, there it is. I, th I think of Hamlet as uh, one of the um, obviously most um, iconic of uh, works in English literature, and you mentioned John, Up John Updike. Uh, others like Tom Stopford have both, for example, uh, yeah. written about Hamlet. Did you have any thought about that as you were getting into this idea or this project? I, I know that, uh, well, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and what was it called? Uh, Claudius and Gertrude, yeah, yeah, which I think was a brilliant novel. Uh, Updike's version uh, starts as, as a kind of prequel, doesn't it? Um, I was I was so shocked by the dismissive reviews uh, of this novel. I, it was such a marvelous jeu d'esprit, with some, I think, some beautiful writing in it. It wasn't on my mind. Um, I I thought maybe I'll go and look at it, but uh, probably I, it might. Di uh, I might feel a bit dispirited because I, uh, if if I looked at it too closely. So I. I just push it to one side. But you remind me, actually, it's a, it's a novel I'd love to reread. And uh, I think there are hundreds of, of, of novels that have taken off from Hamlet. Uh, but um, if one thinks of, in the context of world literature, this is probably the first fully rounded character who is not uh, an exemplar, an exemplar of some characteristic, you know, greed or stupidity or virtue. Uh, and he bursts onto the scene in 1601 um, with such clarity and definition and, and, and such a specific character. Uh, and he's so clever. That's the, <laughs> the other thing. He's one of the cleverest characters in fiction. And I doubt if actually anyone's made a better one since. Um, so I agree with you. I, I think he is a locus. Uh, uh, as I mean, I, alongside it, but still not the height of uh, of Hamlet. I would put Iago uh, and Falstaff. That was really extraordinary, rich, fully formed characters who do not necessarily stand for anything. Um, when Hamlet says, for example. Uh, talking of his own state of depression, I have of late, wherefore I know not, and then goes on to describe you know, his no longer taking exercise and, and feeling low. Uh, there's something existential and modern about the notion that you could feel low and have no reason for it. Wherefore I know not. Not because uh, my, my dad's just been murdered. Um, a generalized depression. And then he goes on to describe what psychiatrists would now do term an anhedonia, the, the loss of all pleasure in the things that give you pleasure, uh, which he does in the sonnets too. Um, so uh, I think Hamlet represents a kind of mountain in, in, a, in, in if you think of literature as a mountain range, this one you know, is Everest and the others are all just the Rockies. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they may crumble. <laughs> when one of your novels is made into a film, do you have a personal rooting interest as to how it's going to turn out in that you'd like to see it be really faithful to what you wrote, or would you be pleased by an independent masterpiece in its own right, a la Hitchcock's Rebecca, yeah. which is certainly not De Maurier's Rebecca? Exactly. That's not that good. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My favorite literary adaptation is John Huston's The Dead, and that is a very close. Um, well, I, having just done the screenplays of my two, you start with a feeling that you just want to 
sort of transfer the inner, inner cinema of your own thoughts onto the screen. But actually, uh, that is a bit boring, and uh, opportunities arise. And also, there are problems to solve. The, the novel is brilliant at describing and conveying inner states. No other art form comes near it for interiority. Um, and movies are hopeless at that. Basically, mo mo movies show you what people said and did. Uh, and you've got to find equivalents for mental states. So I've made loads of changes to my own work. I've torn them apart in some ways. Uh, and it's been interesting to do that. And then, of course, it's collaborative. That's one thing about movies. And the other thing is that uh, the screenwriter is, is really low in the pecking order of things. Uh, you were God when you wrote the novel, but now you're, <laughs> you're kind of road sweeper. Um, <laughs> and uh, you have to just pass through that barrier of self-esteem and where people say, oh, I don't think she'd say a thing like that. And you think, <laughs> wait a minute, she's, she's mine, you know. Uh, <laughs> she, uh, and that takes some getting used to. Uh, I think, though, if these... I'm, I'm almost at the end of my role in this. I will, the rehearsals will be when, as soon as I get back to London. Uh, we've cast... I think I'm allowed to say this. I got into trouble when I mentioned a member of the cast. Uh, so I won't, actually. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, uh, one of the characters in um, the Children Act um, is a fairly well-known American actor. Now, I wrote it entirely uh, for, on the assumption he'd be played by an English actor. We're delighted to have this person. Um, <laughs> and one of the interesting jobs will be to... Sylvester uh, Stallone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I'll be sitting there with a read-through, and I'll, when Sylvester says to me, <laughs> um, he wouldn't say a thing like that. Uh, as an American, I, the, the interest will be to sort of rewrite the part in a way that Sylvester can deliver the lines uh, with comfort. I say this, I did get into such trouble when I mentioned uh, another actor, and I still, not, still don't know if I'm allowed to mention his or her name, uh, because the deal hadn't been done. Um, uh, small print of the deal, and yet we'd been through read-throughs together uh, and had a lot of correspondence, but uh, I got my knuckles wrapped, so I'm not going to... Risk that again. <laughs> Philadelphia, our time is up. Will you please give a warm round of applause to Ian McEwan?